the nation singing louder, cause nothing has the power to say your name, is a strong and mighty tower, your name, is a shelter like no other, your Sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to say but your name. God of this news full of great joy that is for all people this morning and uh, so we can lay all that aside and I'm, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I'd like to invite you to, to pray with me as we start. Father God we are so grateful to be your sons and your daughters. We're thankful for times like this that we can come and share your word with each other that we might Father look into your word for deeper insight and knowledge of who you are and, uh, and what you are in our lives. Father, help us as we look at your prophet Isaiah and as we um, glean from him uh, the the challenge of the way that we live, uh, Father, but of the presentation of your hope and of your salvation and of your messianic message. Uh, We pray, Father, that it will touch our lives where we are, that we might uh, be more in tune with the will that you'd have uh, for each of us to live out. I offer this prayer as we offer our lives in your Son, Jesus. Amen. Um, so, looking at, um, at Isaiah, Isaiah is, uh, by definition, uh, means salvation of the Lord. 
or the Lord is our Savior, the Lord is our salvation. Um, Isaiah has often been referred to as the Messianic prof- prophet. Uh, it's a, he's a prophet who is referred to oftentimes in New, New Testament. You'll see that his prophecies are played out uh, and, um, and proven in the life of Jesus Christ. And so because of that, he's often referred to as the Messianic prophet. Uh, a lot of people will say he's, he's the greatest prophet of all time. Uh, so the, the ability to study his works uh, and to really look into what Isaiah has to offer of us, offer us is, is something of, uh, of great interest. And, and as I've studied it, it's been interesting to me to learn more about it. Um, a, as with most prophets, um, Isaiah spoke of current situations but he also alluded to things that were going to come in the future. There, there's, um, there's very specific situations where, where Isaiah spoke of a, at that time, current day circumstance. But his, his answer and his message, as we read it today, we just see clearly about Christ. It's, uh, and we're going to speak specifically about that. One of them in chapter 7 it is very specific. There's a situation happening with King Ahaz, but in his response to King Ahaz, he, he, he addresses what is going to occur right then, but when he does that, he gives us a glimpse far into the future, and as we look at Scripture today, it's very ready, ready, uh, readily uh, obvious to us that he's referring to Jesus Christ. So, so as we look at, um, at Isaiah, we're going to see... Uh, quite a bit of that. Um, Isaiah was trying to, to, to make, make the message clear to his reader that the Lord of hosts, the Holy One of Israel, and those are terms that you're going to see Isaiah use throughout his book, uh, was faithful to his covenant. He was, he, he was a righteous judge. He, he was a God who was going to uh, be holy in all that he did, and that he was going to call his people back to him even though his people had strayed quite a bit. So part of, um, uh, part of the introduction, we're sometime in the 8th century B.C., sometime 760 or 740 to 700 B.C. Uh, before Christ. <clears throat> we're in 8th century Judah is where we are. We're in a kingdom that is divided. Some 200 years prior, after Solomon's reign ended, the United Kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. Um, Rehoboam, the king that was Solomon's son, was the king then of the southern kingdom of Judah. You had Jeroboam, who was placed as the king over the northern kingdom. So we, we went from this time of a united kingship and united nation to this divided situation. And we'd lived in that for some 200 years by the time we get to Isaiah. And so Isaiah is going to be talking primarily to Judah, to the southern kingdom, through his message here in, in, the, in this book of the prophet. <clears throat> Israel is often referred to as the northern kingdom, and its capital was Samaria. We're going to hear that throughout. You're going to see that throughout the, um, the, the speakings of Isaiah. And it's, in, it's important for you to know as we get into this study the geography of where these nations are. You have this northern kingdom that is surrounded by uh, Syria, further to the north by Assyria. You've got the southern kingdom whose capital is Jerusalem. The southern kingdom, Judah, is bounded to the south by Egypt. These two countries are going to play critical roles in the geopolitical setting of the book of Isaiah and how he he spoke to his people. Um, You all are probably familiar that the northern kingdom was made up of ten tribes, the clans of Jacob, the sons of Jacob. You know, these, these 12 brothers... These clans were given lands, all except two, right? Simeon and Levi. They were scattered throughout the kingdoms. 
Levi primarily to the south, those scattered throughout, and Simeon mostly to the north, in cities that are scattered throughout the kingdom. But these ten tribes made up the northern kingdom, and two tribes made up the southern kingdom, primarily Benjamin and Judah, with, with Levi scattered out throughout them. So, so the division of the nations have occurred, and they're living in that. Okay? Um, each kingdom goes about its own dealings with God. It, it wages its own, own war. It, it has its own internal struggles. It, it, it battles itself against what God would have for it. <clears throat> and that's the, um, that's the world that Isaiah is dealing with. At the time of Isaiah, there's some contemporary prophets. He's not, he's not a lone wolf out here. He's not by himself speaking a message. <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw Amos in here as contemporary. Amos is a little uh, before Isaiah's time. But Amos' message of social injustice and of God's coming judgment is so similar to Isaiah's message. I'm going to throw Amos in there. Amos was a prophet to Israel, as was Hosea. So you have these two prophets that are contemporary with Isaiah speaking to the northern kingdom, taking the message of God to his people, his, the, the remnant, the, the, the part of his people that are in that northern kingdom of Israel. And then you have uh, Micah and Isaiah. And Micah is, is very much a contemporary of Isaiah. He, he's speaking the same time, and he's speaking to the people of Judah. So you've got these two prophets that are bringing the message of God to the southern kingdom. So, so, we've, so we've got Isaiah coming into this uh, 8th century Judah that is, is speaking to a divided kingdom and his focus is to his people of Judah. is to God's people of Judah. And, and he is going to br- preach a message of judgment. He's going to preach a message of salvation. He's going to preach a message of God is king and God is the only one that can accomplish what they need to have accomplished. And he's going to preach a message of a suffering servant. Um, just as additional backdrop, it's, I think it's important to understand that Judah operated under a single dynasty. See, Rehoboam was Solomon's son. So Solomon was David's son. So this Davidic line comes down through Judah. And all of the kings save the, the female king, um, was, were, were uh, descendants of David down through the Davidic line. So, so the house of David is preserved in this southern kingdom Judah. So, so Isaiah's message is brought to these people who have this hope instilled in them. They've been brought up all their lives to know the promise the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenant that God has given. So this is the backdrop that, uh, that Isaiah speaks to. And, and what he does is he speaks under four of these different kings. Right off the bat, we're heard that, uh, that uh, these visions that Isaiah sees um, are during the times of Uzziah, uh, his son Jotham, his son Ahaz, and his son Hezekiah. So this time period of these four kings is the time period in which Isaiah speaks. And that kind of frustrated me a little bit as I was studying because, you know, you think about this, we've got about 40 chapters. And you know over a period of 40 or 50 years, that can't be everything that occurred. And you just, and you just as you look at it, you just go, oh, I just wish I had a little more of this information. I wish I had more of what God shared or what Isaiah uh, spoke about during this time. But we don't. Um, but what we do know is that um, Isaiah served and prophesied to his people under those four kings, those four kings of Judah. Um, uh, under Uzziah and um, uh, Jotham, Judah was fairly prosperous. Their borders were advancing. It was a time of um, prosperity for them. The, um, 
their borders were advancing. Um, they were gaining trade and influence throughout the, uh, the Middle East and the, and the, and the world. <clears throat> and the, the urban middle and upper classes were gaining quite a bit of prosperity and riches at the expense, oftentimes, of those people who lived in the rural areas or those who were poor. And you're going to see Isaiah speak specifically about that when he makes the charge or when he brings God's charge to his people there in the first part of Isaiah. When Ahaz ascended to the throne, um, it was a time of great chaos. Uh, Ahaz um, uh, took over, uh, and he was not a good king. You, you'll see a list of kings from um, uh, uh, whether it be Israel or Judah, and, and, and the writers will oftentimes put, uh, this was a good king, this was a righteous king, this was an evil king, this was a bad king. Well, Uzziah and Jotham, they're put in the good king categories, whereas Ahaz was, a, was an evil king. He sought to do... Um, to do the things more uh, in line of what the, uh, the Assyrians uh, wanted. Uh, he sought coalitions with the Assyrians. And so he became beholden to them. Uh, Hezekiah later on was, uh, uh, was a king who trusted God and, and turned back to him. And we're going to talk about him a little bit later. But um, uh, he turned back an Assyrian assault. Uh, and and the, uh, the host of the Assyrian army was, uh, was defeated because Hezekiah trusted God. So, so the kingships that were occurring when Isaiah was prophesying, you had these three out of the four that were fairly much aligned with what God was seeking them to do. The temple worship, the, uh, 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 the absence of at least in the, um, the monarchy, at least the absence of idolatry, and the absence of, um, uh, of giving that life over to, to um, that sort of uh, pattern. The problem is that the kings couldn't control the people. And so throughout the uh, countryside and throughout the nation, uh, even though we had kings, three of the four, that seemed to want to follow what God's teachings were, what we had was a people that just simply turned their back, became even greater uh, 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 stiff-necked, if you will, and, and didn't care about uh, what the kings and, and the prophets were talking about. So Isaiah would bring this message of holiness, that the holiness of God was what had to be the standard, the banner for the people. It was his faithfulness to his covenant and his righteous judgment that was going to see, his, see the people uh, back to the truth, back to who they really were called to be. And, and they were going to bring it full bore, full, right in front of them. And, and Isaiah was going, to, was going to lay this out so they, they wouldn't have any question as to that he was speaking about them in their lives. Isaiah's going to speak of punishment. I, Isaiah's going to speak that, that this is the situation and the only way that this can be resolved between a holy God and an unrighteous people is that, that this nation is going to have to be cleansed. There's going to have to be a purging. There's going to have to be a cleansing that occurs. Through that cleansing, through that punishment, through that um, refining, then God's going to bring His salvation to this people. He's going to bring His salvation through His Messiah, through His promised uh, son, at the hands, though, through this time, of foreign people and the enemies. God's use of people throughout Scripture is an amazing study. The instruments that we are in this world for God cannot be denied. Whether it's the body of Christ, or whether it's a kingdom that seems to be reviled and evil, and God will see that His people will be cleansed and purged through some pretty bad folks in the Assyrians and the Babylonians as we study through Isaiah. The message of hope, though, rings out. <clears throat> the, um, 
God does not send Isaiah to his people to lay out his case in this great arraignment and say, here are the charges brought against you. <clears throat> and then offer the salvation and the Messiah without providing great hope to these people. So just as we talked earlier where the, the message of Isaiah is to the people and the time that they're living in so that they can see hope through this uh, Assyrian and ultimately this Babylonian, um, uh, the, the Assyrian attacks and this Babylonian captivity, the message is hope. Hold on, because there is going to be a righteous remnant. There is going to be a faithful group. And, and there's going to be a faithful people because I am a faithful God. And I am a God of covenant. I am a God who is going to keep my word to his people. And so the hope for us is that our God is a faithful God. He does what he says he's going to do. He offers us hope through Jesus Christ, our Messiah. He offers us salvation because of a, of a risen Savior. So with that as a backdrop, is, with that as a little bit of background and introduction to the book of Isaiah, I want to try to jump in and I, I want to uh, try to accomplish in the very brief time that we have uh, five um, tasks, if you will. I, I want to look at the, the um, case that Isaiah brought um, uh, against the people. I want, I want you to see with me what God says to the people. Um, I, I want to then look at four different types of um, prophecies that Isaiah provides in the first 11 chapters that give us a glimpse of the salvation and the messianic prophecy and the hope that I've just spoken about. Um, Isaiah, the first chapter. Time simply does not permit me to read any of this. We're, we're going to read some because I just, I wish we could, could listen to the word um, because it's so, it's so driving. But uh, the first uh, 15 verses after, after Isaiah gives his um, timeline of when he's speaking, Isaiah just brings forth to the people their sinful condition. He just simply says, you know, my people don't even know me. The ox knows his master. The donkey knows who he serves. My people don't even know me. They've rebelled and they've turned their back against me. Your body is broken. You've taken so much punishment, yet you ask for more. I can't even punish you anymore because you, you, you're, you're so beaten and you're so broken, but yet that's the way you're acting. You're acting as if, just, just punish me more. Your land is barren. What used to be fertile and, and gave wonderful agricultural crops now is barren. It, it won't even sustain you. And you, and you keep living the way that you live. And, and your worship, the worship that you bring me, it's, it's meaningless to me. It, it has, in fact, it has become a burden to me. That's the condition of the people. They, they have completely turned their back on a God who delivered them. A God who had been faithful to his covenant throughout time to that point. But yet he called him to repentance. See, God is a God who doesn't give up. You know? He, he just doesn't give up. He, he, wants, he wants all to come to repentance. So he called his people, even in their condition... Turn from your evil ways. Do what is right. You know, those sins that are like scarlet, they can be as white as snow. That, that garment that is stained so deeply, 
It can be made crystal clean. But you've got to turn from your evil ways. You've got to seek justice. You've got to encourage those who are oppressed. You've got to defend the fatherless. You've got to defend the widow. You know, we've talked quite a bit um, in a Bible study that I'm in about nations and Christianity and all of that. And I don't, I don't know that God calls America to be this Christian nation. But I will tell you, I think He calls His people, I, I know He calls His people to be His image in this world. And His people were, <clears throat> could care less about the widows. His people could care less about the orphans. His people could care less about those who were oppressed. And Isaiah was putting it squarely in their face that you people who, who are called by my name are not at all being who I am. And so he said, Jerusalem has become a harlot. There is no justice in Jerusalem any longer. It, what, when it used to be full of justice, it's now full of murderers. He emphasized, he said, they don't take care of the oppressed. They don't take care of the fatherless. They don't take care of the widows. They, they only care about themselves. They have stored up great riches. <laughs> God will restore. He promises God will restore. He's going to restore righteous judges, righteous counselors. But only after the point that his people are purified. Only the point where the people are cleansed. So the message from Isaiah starts out in a very strong way. People have to be brought face to face with their sinful condition. And that's what Isaiah does. And so, Isaiah, a Christmas message. And, and all, all that I've done for the first 15 minutes is, is talk about the condition of a sinful Judah. But see, that's what God calls us to do. God calls us to be honest with ourselves. God calls us to look in the mirror and to honestly ask yourself, and ask myself, are you really the image of your Father? And if you're not, there's some cleansing that must occur. There's some righteousness that needs to be restored. And the hope is in the Savior and in the Messiah. So, I've got about 10, 15 minutes and I'm going to try to give you four things that I picked up on because I just simply can't talk about all that's in the first 11 chapters. Um, Isaiah 2. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nation, 
nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Wow, what a great message. After Isaiah had just presented the sinful nature of the people, this is the word of God that comes to his people. I, I read that, I can't help but think about the, the um, dividing wall that Paul speaks about Jesus having torn down in Ephesians. When I read about the peace that's coming, that, then they'll beat plowshares into um, um, spears into pruning hooks. It speaks of a peace. It speaks of people being drawn not by architecture or appearance, but, but drawn to righteous judgment. It speaks, it speaks to those heeding the call that will walk in the light of the Lord. And that the Lord alone in that day will be exalted. It, it speaks to a Christ who tears down all opposition between those who heed the call and a God who seeks righteousness and holiness. It speaks to a Christ who that when He's lifted up will draw all men unto Him. It speaks a message of salvation and it speaks a message of messianic hope. But it also in that day and time speaks hope to those people. Isaiah did not forget those people. God did not forget those people and the peace that they needed, the hope they needed. But it was... It was a message that Isaiah, getting lost up in the, in the fact that he's this prophet and he sees these great visions, that he couldn't help himself but cast a vision of hope to something far in the future that holds something for so many other people other than just those that are hearing his message. The Lord will be exalted. And in that day, the Lord alone will be exalted. Isaiah 6, probably a very familiar passage to many of us in this room. I'm not going to touch on the worshipful um, scene that takes place. Um, I, I, I am going to address the fact that Isaiah, when he was there, received his purification. Remember, he called out. He said, I am an unholy lips. I am a man of unholy lips. And remember the seraphim approached Isaiah with a burning coal, touched his lips, purified Isaiah. Symbolically, as, he's, as, as, as God is going to purify his people. But he says the, the cleansing of the nation, Isaiah's purification occurs and um, uh, issues this proclamation. Uh, God asked, he says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, uh, Isaiah said, here I am, send me. And he, and he gave Isaiah a message. He said, go and tell these people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and, their clo and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. The people, God knew that they were going to turn their back on his message. But that did not cause him not to send Isaiah to his people. You know, I don't, I don't want us to be frustrated in the fact that what, what good is it going to be for us to take a message that seems old and outdated to a world? It's because once it's put out there, it doesn't return empty. See, God was going to say, take this message. Take this message to my people. But he understood that so many of them were going to be dull of hearing. That their, their hearts wouldn't understand. And then, and then Isaiah says, for how long, O Lord? He said, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, till the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged, 
until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains of the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Isaiah receives a call. And Isaiah receives a message of the holy seed in this stump. You know, you can clear land and you can cut down trees. If you don't kill that stump, that tree is going to come back. You can clear privet hedge and if you don't, clear, if you don't kill that stuff, y'all can all attest to the fact that it's going to grow back by the next spring. And you just chop it again. Well, see, very symbolically, this, this, this people is going to be laid to waste. There's going to be a cleansing at the hand of the foreigners. There, there, there is going to be uh, people uh, scattered afar. It's going to be a wasteland is what God describes to, to Isaiah. And he says, I want you to continue my message throughout this time because there is going to be a holy seed that's left, that's planted, that is going to come back. Um, look at uh, Isaiah uh, 10, 20 with me real quick. In that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A message of Isaiah that's all through this book is that don't rely on yourself. Don't don't rely on this great king from the north as your salvation. Don't, don't rely on some alliance with the people to the south for your saving grace. Rely on Yahweh. Rely on Jehovah God. And, and what's going to happen is once purified, the people, the holy seed of Israel, will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One, of Israel. Um, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to try to get to these next two, so I'm going to go kind of quickly. Uh, keeping keeping um, on this line of, of, of the call and, and the stump, and now a branch. Uh, chapter 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power. The branch of the stump of Jesse is our Lord. It is is our Messiah. When you read this, you can almost almost see the words of of the writers of the New Testament jumping out at you. Paul talks about the spirit of wisdom and understanding in the book of Ephesians. And here it says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power. You know, Timothy talks about that, that uh, God does not give us a spirit of timidity of, but, or of fear, but of, of that of power and of love. the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. You remember when at Christ's baptism, where it says the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, when he came up out of the water and the dove descended on him? The the spirit rested on him just as the dove did. The branch will shoot forth from the stump of Jesse. And then skipping back to Isaiah 4. Starting in verse 2. And in that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors in Israel. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. The, The holy seed of Israel is going to be a result of the cleansing of the people and a purification of the nation. And and the fact that we get to claim a loving Messiah 
is the fact that that remnant was, remain, was retained and the message of the Messiah was the faithful calling out and, and fulfilling of the covenant of God to us in our lives. And, and what it is, it's, it's a call to each of our lives that we fully rely on the Holy One of Israel. And that, and in only that, can we claim the salvation of Jesus Christ. It's because that I have fully relied on the Holy One of Israel. You have chosen to fully rely on the Holy One of Israel. And through that, the salvation and the messianic message is received in our lives. Okay, I've got two more. <laughs> okay, Ahaz. I kind of like this. This is for you political and, and, and uh, military guys and gals. This is, this is good stuff. But, but Ahaz uh, took over for Jotham. Right? So he's the third king in the time of Isaiah. And so Ahaz was, um, had turned away from God. He was an evil king. He, he uh, put up idols, and, and the people had, had, by his leading, turned even more uh, idolatrous in their lifestyle. Um, Ahaz was fully aware of the movement of Assyria. What he did not know, however, was that his brothers of the northern kingdom and the adjacent Syria nation, referred to as Aram by Isaiah most of the time, were conjuring up this plan together that they were going to do a preemptive strike on Jerusalem so that they would have greater power and strength to offset the Assyrian attack. Well, Ahaz was worried about this. So he had gone out to the edge of town you can read about this in chapter 7 of Isaiah. He'd gone to the edge of town. He was kind of inspecting the, the uh, water system. Um, there's some speculation as to why he might have been doing that. But, but maybe preparing for an attack. How was he going to uh, safeguard the, the water, uh, water supply for his city? God told Isaiah, go to Ahaz. Tell him, listen, don't be troubled. I know you're concerned, but I want, I want you to be careful and be calm, and do not be afraid. Boy, is that a message that rings out through Scripture, right? Be careful, be calm, do not be afraid. Just trust in God, and I will deliver you. That wasn't good enough for Ahaz. Isaiah said, listen, ask for a sign from God. Ahaz said, you know what, I don't need a sign from God. I'm not going to test God. He, he kind of says that, you know, you know what, I'm not going to put God to the test. Well, that wasn't what he was saying. He was saying, I don't need God. Because, see, what I've done is I've, I've, I've gotten the king of Assyria, and we're going to create this alliance, and we're going to defeat this onslaught onto Jerusalem. Remember, is the capital of the southern kingdom. Okay? So Ahaz does not heed the warning of Isaiah. He enters into that alliance with Assyria. And ultimately, probably no more than 10 years later, um, the Assyrians take into captivity the entire northern kingdom. But what happens is God gives him a sign anyway. He says, that's fine. Whether you want to test me or not, here's your sign. And in, in chapter 7, Isaiah says, The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And Isaiah getting caught up in the prophecy gives us a glimpse and probably one of the sweetest verses that we have in all of Scripture. I don't have enough time to go into the specifics of the next couple of verses. It's a great study. You need to look at that because Isaiah's prophecy goes on and, and talks about a young man who before he knows right from wrong is going to see these two kings torn asunder. And so Isaiah gives a message to the current time, which, which is, is a message for those people. But he gives a message for all time 
when he says, the virgin will be, child, will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And through that, the people of Judah are given hope and given a messianic message. All right. Last but not least, y'all. And uh, I'm, I'm over time, aren't I? Okay. Um, Isaiah 9. We're going to do a little reading together. And, um, um, and then we're going to close. Chapter 9 of Isaiah. Nevertheless, there will be no, no more gloom for those who are in distress. I, I just got to stop right there. Nevertheless, re- regardless of what has occurred, regardless of what you've experienced, regardless of what has happened or what will happen, there will be no more gloom and distress. Wow. How, how, do you, how do you hear that kind of message in the midst of all that was going on in that geopolitical Judah and Israel at that time? How do you hear that message? How do you hear that message in your lives today? Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom and distress. How do you receive that? Man, I hope you receive it with joy and, and gratitude and graciousness because that's the message. That's the message of hope because the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called. Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and peace will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over in His kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. No more gloom and despair for those who are in distress. There's a call for us to get out of that. A call for us to turn away from that because of the saving grace and salvation of Jesus Christ. I'm going to end this morning by reading Luke 1, 30, 35 um, on the heels of the reading of Isaiah 9. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Amen. All right, y'all are dismissed.